We're officially on the record. Let's call the case of the United States versus Kara Bassett. My name is Phil Pascarillo. Uh, scoring judges, we talked about this a second ago, but just make sure uh, the lower left, look to the lower left of your screen and make sure your audio and video is turned off and make sure that they stay off until the end of the trial. Um, you should also have your video setting set to hide all non-video participants, meaning the only people you should see on the screen right now are me and the two advocates. Um, can the attorneys please make appearances before we get started? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Grieve, and along with my co-counsel, Mr. Kevin Johnson, we represent the state. Thank Hello, you. Your Honor. My name is Richard Madden, and along with my second chair, Ms. Gina Piriano, who will be assisting me with technological matters during the round, we represent Ms. Carol Bassett. Okay. Um, thank you. Are there any pretrial matters that we have to talk about before we get going? Yes, Your Honor. We would like to bring to the court's attention pretrial order number seven, which states exhibits four through 33 have been pre-admitted. Counsel, is that your understanding of what uh, that specific section of the pretrial order says? Yes, Your Honor, that's our understanding. Okay. Um, I, I just asked that before you display something, you just uh, let me know that that's one of the pre-admitted exhibits. That way uh, we're on the same page. Yes, Your Honor. And we move to invoke rule 615, the constructive sequestration of all witnesses. Any objection? Uh, without objection, Your Honor, however, the defendant, Ms. Kara Bassett, will be at table during today's trial. Given our online Zoom format, she just won't be visible. Is she going to testify? Uh, no, Your Honor. She will not be called to the stand. Okay. Um, with that, then, uh, by agreement, all witnesses will be uh, sequestered constructively. Yes, Your Honor. With that, we're ready to go. All right. Defense, do you have any kind of pretrial matters before we get going? Yes, Your Honor, just one. Uh, going to that same pretrial order form that the prosecution just uh, noted, uh, number 11 states that on August 18th, 2018, in Leon County in the state of Florida, declared Don Clark deceased. Uh, State's counsel, is that your understanding uh, as well? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, uh, so noted. Anything further? With that, the defense is ready to proceed to opening statements. All right. Uh, Counsel, do you wish to make an opening statement on behalf of the state? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. And before, actually, before we get going, uh, just I'll, I'll give a, a quick statement to the scoring judges. We're about to hear opening statements from both sides, so everyone should make, make sure that they're in speaker view right now. So I'm going to go ahead and, and set my view to speaker view as well. It's in the upper right of your screen. Um, and counsel, just make sure that your audio is muted while your opponent is speaking. Okay, uh, whenever you're ready. May it please the court. The defendant kept her promise. Members of the jury, today you're going to learn that the defendant, Kara Bassett, made a promise. That as the head caretaker at the Tallahassee Elephant Sanctuary, she made a promise to protect her animals by any means necessary. In the words of the defendant, she would take people to the grave if she had to. No fewer than one month after the defendant made that promise, her husband, Don Clark, the owner of that elephant sanctuary, disappeared. Now this is Don. He was a father to two children, a valued member of his community. But the evidence will show the defendant saw Mr. Clark as a threat to her animals, to her sanctuary, to the life that she wanted to have. So on the 18th of August, 2017, the defendant kept that promise she made. You're going to hear that was the night she killed her husband. It's for these reasons we charge the defendant with murder. And with that charge, we carry a burden a burden to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant intentionally killed her husband. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And we'll meet that burden by showing three things to you today. Why she did it, and how she did it, and what evidence the defendant left behind. So let's start with that first question. Why? Well, the evidence will show Mr. Clark wanted that reserve to be a business, not a charity. 
but he kept their elephants in cages. He charged fees for admission, even let guests ride around that park on the backs of the elephants. So you'll hear in 2017, after years of watching what the defendant would call cruel mistreatment to her animals, she took matters into her own hands. She killed her husband. She inherited everything. That sanctuary and his $8 million in assets. So that brings us to that second point. How? In a few moments, Special Agent Steph Johnson is going to tell you about her investigation. She'll explain how two things are missing from that sanctuary to this day. A Don Clark in a syringe filled with enough poison to kill a man 10 times over. And then Agent Johnson will walk you through the night Mr. Clark disappeared. She'll explain how the evidence shows the defendant killed him, drove Mr. Clark to a nearby swamp filled with alligators to make sure his body would never be found. And she waited a week to report her husband missing. But you're going to hear that week wasn't enough time to cover her tracks. And that brings us to the third point. You're gonna see what the defendant left behind. You see, the van used to transport Mr. Clark's body to that swamp, it had a GPS tracker. We know the defendant drove that van to the swamp, got out and pushed her husband into it. You know this because you're going to see the defendant's boots covered in mud from that swamp. You're gonna learn the evidence ties Kara Bassett to this crime. Members of the jury, the defendant made a promise. And even when her husband got in the way, she kept it. For these reasons, at the end of this trial, I'll come back up here and ask that you find the defendant guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Defense, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court? Your Honor, members of the jury, they got the wrong wife. Now, Ms. Greaves, she just stood here and she told you a few things that you might hear throughout today's case. Let's go over a few of them. She told you that a man named Don Clark, a zoo owner, from Tallahassee, Florida, disappeared in August of 2017. The defendant, Ms. Bassett, doesn't disagree. Ms. Grieve stood here and she told you that Mr. Don Clark was most likely murdered on that same day that he went missing. Again, the defendant does not disagree. Ms. Grieve also told you that it was Don's former wife who murdered him. Well, members of the jury, the defendant, Ms. Kara Bassett, again, does not disagree. You see, Ms. Greaves stood here and she told you a lot about the person who may have killed Don. Told you that they, they were close to them, that they started an intimate life with him, that they had a grudge, a reason to get back at Don, something that they wanted from him. A person who promised to love Don in sickness and in health. But members of the jury, that person is not named Kara Bassett. In fact, a person that Ms. Grieve didn't tell you about is Don's first wife, Ms. Lisa Clark. And as Ms. Grieve told you a lot about quotes and things about Don and Kara's relationship that may have raised red flags with you, I want to tell you about a few more quotes you might hear throughout today's case. I will wipe you off the face of the earth. You'll be sorry. Tell our husband to stop dodging my calls. I want what's mine. I'm glad that Don died. Now you just may be asking yourselves exactly why would Ms. Grief stand here and give quotes that weren't as damning as the ones that I just gave you? And that's because they don't come from the defendant, Kara Bassett. In fact, members of the jury, all three of those quotes were said by Don Clark's first wife, Lisa Clark. And we expect you to hear plenty about who Lisa Clark is throughout today's, tri today's trial. You'll hear that Don and Lisa were married well before Kara and Don got married. But only a month after they got divorced did Don get a new wife. 
You hear all about the contempt and harassment that Lisa held for Don and Kara and their relationship that they started right after theirs had ended. And exactly about why Lisa wanted to get back at Don. But even then, members of the jury, that may not be enough doubt for you. That may not be enough reason to doubt the story that Ms. Grieve told you. We won't in there. We're going to call him TV producer, Joe Kwong, someone who has literally thousands of hours of research and film documented at that zoo. And they're going to tell you about the numerous times that Lisa appeared at the zoo, about the time she needed the police called on her, about all the times she threatened Don and Kara's relationship. Members of the jury, we're going to give you plenty of reason to doubt the story told by the government today. But as the defense, we don't have a burden in today's case. We don't have to prove a single fact. We don't have to bring any evidence. We don't have to call a single witness today. That lies solely with the prosecution. But we will. We're going to show you today exactly the holes in the prosecution's case and exactly why you can't trust the investigation that they did. We're going to show you that the investigation only pointed to the first person that they could find who was closest to them and would just answer their questions. The defendant, Kara Bassett. You'll hear about Kara today. She's a loving woman who only wanted to take care of the animals that she loved the most, the elephants. She begged and pleaded to have a nonprofit sanctuary so that they could roam free, only run with donations and volunteers, a person incapable of committing this crime, a person who would never, ever harm the husband that she loved so much. But again, members of the jury, I want you to think back to all of the doubt that you have throughout today's case. Think about Lisa Clark. Think about the investigation that the investigators actually did. What evidence did they gather and who didn't they speak to? We expect it to be clear to you, members of the jury, that Lisa Clark is actually the only witness that was uncooperative in the entire investigation. They spoke to every single person, unturned every single stone, and the only one left was Lisa's, and they never got to her. Members of the jury, by the end of today's trial, we expect it to be abundantly clear to you that the prosecution can't prove their case. They can't prove that it was only Kara. They can't prove that she was the only person with malintent, and they can't even prove that Don was found dead. Members of the jury, we expect there to be plenty of reason to doubt this case, and that you'll believe that the government has got the wrong wife. We're going to ask you for the only reasonable verdict in today's case, that you find the defendant, Ms. Kara Bassett, not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, does the government have any witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. We call it Steph Johnson. Before uh, you actually call that witness, um, we are, are now going to turn to the witness portion. So I'm going to ask all the scoring judges to switch the gallery view. And that is also in the upper right uh, corner of your screen. And that'll obviously allow you to see the witness, uh, the witnesses and the attorneys at the same time. And I'm going to mute myself because I forgot last time. Permission to proceed? Go ahead. Could you please state your name? Hello, my name is Steph Johnson. What do you do for a living? I'm a special agent with the FBI. How long have you been a special agent? Since back in 2003, I've been with them for about 17 years now. Agent Johnson, why are you here today? I'm here today because I was the responding officer to the disappearance of Don Clark. How did you first get involved in that investigation? Sure. So on August 25th, I was responding to a call of a missing person, Don Clark, coming from the Bassett residence. Do you know who reported Mr. Clark missing? I do. It was the defendant, Kara Bassett. Did you ever speak with Ms. Bassett? Yes, I was able to. Based on that conversation, what did you learn about her relationship with Don Clark? I learned that her relationship with Don Clark was a bit strained. The defendant told me that she and her husband were disagreeing about how they wanted to run the elephant park that they both owned. Let's talk through those disagreements. What did the defendant tell you about them? The defendant told me that her husband wanted to run the animal park more like a business. 
but the defendant is somebody who really cares about animals. So she wanted to run it more like a sanctuary where the elephants could roam free, but her husband wasn't with it. Now, did you ever find any evidence that the defendant stood to financially gain from her husband's disappearance? Yes, we found some evidence of a potential motive of the defendant with those disagreements and also the possibility that this defendant could financially gain in the event of her husband's death. And what led you to believe the defendant would financially gain from his death? I was made aware of something called a power of attorney agreement that was between the defendant and her husband, Don Clark. It was in effect at the time that he disappeared. So what did that power of attorney mean for the defendant if her husband went missing? The power of attorney agreement indicated to me that in the event of Don Clark's disappearance or his death, the defendant stood to gain pretty much all of his assets, including that animal park. Do you know how much those assets were in total? I do. After reviewing the obituary, I was able to determine that Don Clark was worth around $8 million. I'd like to walk through the timeline of events of your investigation. Mr. Johnson, if you could put on the screen the testimony that the, that the agent has stated. Now, about that power of attorney agreement, do you know what date it was signed? I do, ma'am. If I recall correctly, it was back on May 1st. Mr. Johnson, if you could put that on the screen. Did you ever communicate with the attorney who drafted Mr. Clark's agreement? In a way. I was able to review a letter from that attorney that indicated to me some helpful information to my investigation when I was looking further into the relationship between Don Clark and the defendant. What did that letter tell you? Unfortunately, we learned that Don Clark had filed for a protection order against his wife in the months leading up to his disappearance. According to that letter, when did Mr. Clark sign that agreement? According to that agreement, it was signed around June 20th of that same year, 2017. Mr. Johnson, if you could put that testimony on the screen. Let's move on to Mr. Clark's disappearance. But when was the last he was reported to be seen? Based on my conversations with the defendant, the defendant claims that she last saw her husband on August 18th of 2017. So what did your investigation find? We found a couple of pieces of evidence that gave us a lot of information about what potentially could have happened the day that Don disappeared, starting with some GPS tracking data on his van the van that Don Clark owned. I'd like to walk through the GPS information you found for the night Mr. Clark was last seen. Mr. Johnson, you could take us forward. So according to the information you uncovered, where was that van the night that Mr. Clark disappeared? The night that Don Clark disappeared, his van was at home for a period of time in the afternoon. So between around 12 o'clock in the afternoon on the 18th, to around 11.17 that night, his van was parked at the property that he shared with his wife, Kara Bassett. Mr. Johnson, if you could put that time on the screen. So you said that the van was there until 11.17 p.m. What happened next, according to the GPS? When I took a closer look at that GPS data, I found that the van started moving right after that time. So right after 11.17 p.m., that van is on the move and arrives at a place called Big Gum Swamp at around 1.26 that same morning, the following morning, excuse me. Mr. Johnson, if you could put that up there. Could you describe what Big Gum Swamp is for the members of the jury? Sure, it's, it's like a, it's a, a hunting spot. So it's a body of water, natural, and it has a bunch of wild animals in it, like alligators and fish. So how long was the van parked at the swamp that night? The van was at this big gum swamp location for about 45 minutes before it was on the move again. Where did the van go next? After the van left this swamp, 
the van was headed to an airport. Now this airport was called the Cary Bell Leone Airport. It was about five miles from the property that Miss Bassett shared with her husband. So they were going back in the direction towards the property. Could you tell us at what time that van arrived at the airport? Sure. I remember correctly, it was about 426 in the morning. Mr. Johnson, you could put that on the screen. Agent, did you ever find Mr. Clark? No, we were never able to find. So based on this timeline, when was Mr. Clark actually reported missing by the defendant? The FBI only received the call that Don Clark was missing on August 25th, 2018. And based on my conversations with the defendant, that was about a week after he actually went missing. Mr. Johnson, if you could put that on the screen. Agent, let's talk about how this may have happened. Did you ever identify a potential murder weapon? I was actually. After searching the property and speaking to the defendant, we were able to figure out that on the property, there were these things called elephant tranquilizers. Objection, Your Honor, to lack of foundation. May I be heard? Sure. Uh, what the, in detect, the investigator is about to listen on to the record is that they found these tranquilizers, they found that one was missing, and this led her to believe that it may have been used in the murder. However, there is zero connection between that tranquilizer being missing and the disappearance of Don Clark. There needs to be foundation laid as to how it connects to this trial specifically in order to lay that on the record as a potential murder weapon. So, so your, your issue is with uh, the witness saying that she recovered, quote, a murder weapon with respect to a missing surround. Okay, I understand. Counsel, what's your response? Well, Your Honor, Mr. Matt is putting the cart before the horse here. We haven't elicited any statements about a missing syringe. All I asked was, did you identify a potential murder weapon? Just an item that could be used to kill another human being. Now, the witness stated that after speaking to the defendant, and it was through her investigation of the actual site, she found these physical tranquilizers herself. I'm going to overrule the objection with the, the caveat that counsel phrased her question asking for a potential murder weapon. And your argument is, is certainly um, an area that you can explore on cross-examination. So overruled. Yes, Your Honor. So Agent, let me ask you that question again. Did you ever find a potential murder weapon? We did find something that could potentially be a murder weapon, yes. After my conversations with the defendant, we discovered that there were items on the property called elephant tranquilizers. Did you ever learn how much of that elephant tranquilizer was kept on the elephant sanctuary grounds? We were able to figure out that there was supposed to be 24 bottles of this care fentanyl substance on the property. So how many of those tranquilizers did you actually find? And when we searched the property, we only found 23. One was missing. Did you ever find any forensic evidence of the defendant going to that swamp? Actually, we did. We were able to do forensic testing on the defendant's boots. And we know that they're the defendant's boots because we asked the defendant whether or not they were the boots that belonged to her. And she agreed that they were. So we tested the mud that was present on the bottom of those boots and the defendant's belongings and compared it to the mud that was present at the swamp. Did you ever find out if that mud was a match to those boots? Yes. When we tested the mud that was on the defendant's belongings and present inside of the van that was once at the Big Bear. Under, under Rule 403, may I be heard? Sure. The objection is to the, the specific wording of the investigator here. Uh, the investigator and opposing counsel know the only things that were tested that even could be remotely classified as belonging to Ms. Kara Bassett are the work boots that she uses on the zoo and a wheelchair that belonged to the zoo itself. For the detective to constantly say on the record, retested her belongings is improper. That's not what happened. I'm not sure I understand. What did, what did the witness just say that you have an issue with? Uh, that they tested uh, her belongings, the belongings of the defendant. And okay. that's not the case. I understand. Yes, please. And that's to be substantially more prejudicial than probative for it to be excluded. We have faith the members of the jury will take the statement, we tested her belongings, to mean they tested some of her belongings. This doesn't meet that high bar. 
Um, I'm going to overrule the objection. You can explore that on cross. Yes, Your Honor. So, Agent, did that mud match the defendant's boots? Yes, it did. We found that it was a match. Did you ever ask the defendant if she'd been to Big Gum Swamp? We definitely did, and the defendant denied ever going to Big Gum Swamp. Thank you, Agent. No further questions. Ross? Yes, Your Honor, may I proceed? You may. All right, I want to start off with some of the things that you just talked about on direct, some of the evidence that you gathered, starting with the syringe that you mentioned. You say that you found that one of the syringes of elephant tranquilizers was missing, correct? Yes, that's true. In the course of your entire investigation, you never recovered that missing syringe, did you? No, sir, we were not able to. Not a single eyewitness told you they saw that missing syringe, did they? No, sir, we were not able to recover. Ma'am, you never recovered the victim's body either, did you? No. Right, the only reason he was declared deceased was because the defendant declared him deceased a year later, correct? No, sir, that's not the only reason. Well, that's why he was declared deceased, right? It was part of the reason, yes. Right, because investigators never actually found if he was murdered, correct? We do have probable cause to believe that he was murdered, yes. I'm not asking if you have probable cause, I'm asking what you actually found. And you never found Don Clark's body, yes or no? No, we did not. So you have no autopsy report for Don's body, correct? No, sir. So you can't tell the members of the jury factually whether or not that tranquilizer was ever used on Don Clark, can you, detective? And not with the 100% certainty that you're looking for, counselor. I wanna ask you about this other piece of evidence that you mentioned, this algae and mud that you tested on the boots, correct? Yeah. To be clear for the members of the jury, you didn't test a plethora of things belonging to Ms. Bassett, did you? Uh, no, we tested her boots. Right, you tested her boots, her work boots that she uses for outside, correct? Yes. You have no eyewitnesses that say that Ms. Bassett was the one wearing those boots on the night in question, do you? No. You have no eyewitness testimony seeing Ms. Bassett leave her residence at all on the night in question, do you? No, none of the witnesses said that. I want to talk to you about something else you brought up on your direct examination. You talked about a letter that you got from an attorney, correct? Yes. You talked about how this attorney detailed some of the relationship between Don and, and uh, Kara, correct? Yes, I did. You also talked about a potential restraining order that Don tried to get against Kara, correct? I did. In that same exact letter, this attorney also mentions the restraining order that Don tried to get against his first wife, Lisa Clark, doesn't he? And that is mentioned. He also mentioned that Lisa Clark was almost delusional, didn't he? Who did? The, the attorney who sent you that letter. Uh, yes. He told you that despite there being no evidence for Lisa Clark wanting this lawsuit against Dawn, she wasn't having any of it, right? Yes, I believe that's what it says. It tells you that Lisa Clark harassed Dawn and Kara, doesn't it? Yes, that was the claim within that letter. I want to talk to you about which you, who you talked to during your investigation. You spoke to Kara, right? Yes, of course. You spoke to her numerous times, didn't you? Yes, I did. She cooperated with the entire investigation, didn't she? Yes, she did. She came in every single time you asked her to, correct? Yes, she did. She even sat down for a formal FBI interview, didn't she? Yes, I spoke to her about 12 times. Let's talk about some of the other people that you tried to speak to. You know that there were three people that had access to the zoo who have no alibis for the night in question, don't you? Yes, they were employees at the zoo. You know, one of them is Don's son, correct? Yes. He was unable to provide you an alibi of where he was that night, correct? That's true. You know that two of the other people there were just employees like Don's son, correct? Yes. You know one of them was Nate Garson, don't you? I do. You know that NG Nate Garson is initialed a few times on that syringe checkout sheet, isn't it? Yes, that is someone who had access to the carifentanil as well. So, detective, you had someone without an alibi who also had access to something you claim is the murder weapon? Sure, but there was no motive for that person to be involved in Don's death. Of course. Let's move on to Lisa Clark then. You also tried to speak to Lisa Clark, didn't you? We did make an attempt, but she was not cooperative with the investigation, unfortunately. Right. She was the only witness in your entire investigation who was uncooperative, correct? That is true. Lisa even told you that she was glad that Don died, didn't she? Objection, Your Honor, to hearsay. 
response? Your Honor, that's a then existing mental state. After she heard the shocking news of her, of her former husband having died, she immediately responded with, I'm glad that he died. I hope he was fed to the elephants. Hang on a second. Before you respond, that's, that, that wasn't exactly what I heard the witness's statement to be. What exactly did the witness say a second ago? Uh, what were her exact words? I, I thought uh, it was just the first part, not the second thing you said. Yes, Your Honor. I was elaborating on the full quote for the uh, point of this objection argument, but the part of the quote that I elicited in the question was that I'm glad Don is dead. Do you intend to ask her about the second piece uh, of uh, the quote that we haven't gotten to yet? No, Your Honor, I do not. So then let's just deal with the, th with the statement that she actually said. Yes, Count, Your what's your response to the, to the um, 8033, that existing mental state argument? Your Honor, uh, hope doesn't fall under 8033. A statement of my then existing mental condition could be that I'm tired, that I have a headache. A uh, hope doesn't fall under that exception. So, so is, it, is it your contention that the statement, I am glad, wouldn't fall under that, that exception? I would, wouldn't agree with that, Your Honor, but the quote I believe counsel was trying to elicit was that they hoped that Don had been killed. Counsel, my understanding was that the witness said, I'm glad he's dead, and that was the statement you're listening. Am I correct about that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, counsel, understanding that that is the only statement that, that defense, defense counsel is going to elicit, what is your response? Or does that change your response to the then, exi then existing mental state argument? And that doesn't change our response, Your Honor. That's not the spirit of the exception. Okay. Um, understanding those are the arguments, I'm going to allow uh, the statement to come in. Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes. So, Immediately after you told his former wife that her husband, her former husband had died, she told you, I'm glad Don is dead, didn't she? And that were her words. You never got to speak to her at length about those words, did you? I was not because she was not willing to have a conversation. She also couldn't provide you any alibi for the night of, could she? That is true. And you all never looked into Lisa Clark any further, did you? No, we had no need to. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. Briefly, Your Honor. Proceed. Agent, did you ever find any evidence that Mr. Clark's ex-wife had gone to Big Gum Swamp the night he disappeared? No, absolutely not. And that's what I meant, what I said a moment ago, that we had no need to further investigate Lisa because all of the forensic evidence in this case led back to the defendant. Thank you, Agent. No further questions. Okay. Defense counsel, do you have anything else for this witness? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And just so I'm clear, uh, are you guys both on the same page that there is uh, recross permitted in this jurisdiction? Yes, yes Your, Your Honor. Honor. Based on the scope of the previous examination. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Now, you were just asked by your attorney about reasons to believe Lisa Clark would have been involved in a day of, correct? Yes, I was. You read uh, Don's phone records, didn't you? I did. You know that outside the scope. We've gone far outside the question of my examination, which was ex-wife being at Big Gum Swamp the night Mr. Clark disappeared. Counsel, can you make an offer of proof, obviously constructive outside, uh, constructively outside the presence of the jury as to what, where you're going with this? Yes, Your Honor. We're going to prove here that the victim, Mr. Don Clark in this case, his phone records indicate that he was in contact with Lisa Clark on the day of and that there was indication of a possible meetup. Overruled. Now, you read Don's phone records, correct? Yes, I reviewed them. You know that Lisa messaged him saying, to let, let's get, out of, get rid of the lawyers and meet up, correct? Uh, she said, let's handle this like adults. Right. Then they had a short phone call, correct? That's true. And that all happened on the day that Don disappeared, correct? It did, but there was no indication that they were going to meet up. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. I assume we're done with this witness? And that's right, Your Honor. We ask that the agent be excused. Okay. Government, what else do you have? We've got nothing. We rest our case. Okay. Defense, are you ready to go? Yes, Your Honor. We call Joe Kwong to the stand. Okay. And may we proceed? Go ahead. Can you please introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, hi, I'm Joe Kwong. Ms. Kwong, what do you do for a living? I make films. These days, I'm really focused on documentaries. Can you tell us exactly how did you get into filmmaking? 
Well, I grew up in LA, uh, so it was always my childhood dream to uh, be in front of the camera. I later learned that I couldn't act. Um, so instead, I went to film school, and I've been doing that ever since. All right, I want to move on and talk about today's case specifically. How exactly are you involved with the Tallahassee Zoo? Well, around two years ago, I got a phone call from a woman named Kara Bassett. She told me she was interested in hiring me to create a documentary about her private elephant park. I felt like I really had something, you know? Um, now it feels a little overdone. Well, in filming for the park, did you ever get to know Don Clark while you were there? Of course. I saw the man every day for years. Uh, and what exactly was your time with Don Clark like? We'd see each other every day. Uh, Don and I became good friends. He was a, had a great sense of humor, and I learned to love him and his wife. Ms. Kwong, when was the last time that you saw Don? The last time I saw Don was on August 18th of 2017, the day that he disappeared. Did you speak to him that day? I did, yes. Um, it was really a normal day like we've had for years there. Um, we were talking in the late afternoon and he got a text message that changed his entire demeanor. Did anything about your interaction worry you at all? Not really, no. Um, he left and told me that he'd see me when he got back. And you, did you see Don after you got back? I didn't, actually. Um, he disappeared later that day. Oh, Ms. Kwong, you said you were there to film the zoo. Did you film any more after Don disappeared? I did, yes. I stayed on as Kara was the one who hired me, and she wanted me to film Kara. So I spent a good amount of time still filming at the sanctuary. Is there anything else that you were filming there? Yes. I ended up going on a trip to Costa Rica and a trip to Mexico. I had some side projects for uh, documentaries of mine, but for the most part, I was filming at the sanctuary with Kara. Oh, Ms. Kwong, did you ever speak to the police in the case of the, during the course of this investigation? A little bit. Um, the FBI barely spoke to me. Um, they never asked for my footage at all. Uh, so I didn't really get to talk to them that much. Did you and Kara ever talk about the investigation? A little bit. We did. Exactly. What did you all talk about? We talked about how, uh, miss, how she missed her husband dearly, how she didn't know where Don was, and how she wanted this to get wrapped up quickly so that we could find him. To hearsay the statement of the defendant specifically that she did not know where Don was. Response? Yes, Your Honor. We're not using this for the truth of the matter here, only to the effect on the listener how Ms. Kwong reacted to these statements and what she did uh, in response. And the next question is directly going to go to how she responded to this. Outside of the presence of the jury, can you proffer what she's going to say the, she did or what the effect was? Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Kwong, upon hearing all of this and trying to figure out what's going on with the investigation, actually ended up recording the police and seeing how they were conducting the investigation against Ms. Bassett. So you're saying this witness is going to say because she was told by your client that she didn't know where Don was, that's why she started recording the police? That's, that's the kind of link between the effect and the statement? Uh, well, loosely, Your Honor, if the witness was allowed to finish, she was going to go into how they had multiple conversations and how Kara actually led her to believe that the police were mishandling the investigation. Okay, government, what's your response? We're shoehorning in statements of the defendant here, Your Honor. To know that the statements of the defendant had an effect on the listener, all the witness would have to say is, I kept filming because Kara asked me to, or I kept filming because it seemed like that's what Kara wanted. To say specifically the statement that Kara didn't know where Don was, it is being used for the truth. It's not being used to show an effect on the listener. Sustained. Move to strike that statement, Your Honor. Stricken. May we proceed? Yes. Now, Ms. Kwong, in your conversations with Kara, did you ever get the indication you needed to do anything? Myself, not necessarily. I was there to film Kara and the documentary, 
But given that the investigation was going on for weeks, I ended up filming some of that uh, when the police were on the ground. And did you notice anything about the investigation in your filming? Well, like I mentioned earlier, the, the police barely talked to me, um, but I did catch them on occasion touching things around the park uh, without gloves on. I I'm no expert of law enforcement, but I remember one time specifically, I saw an FBI agent touch a syringe and, and Agent Johnson, who was a lead investigator, reprimanded them. Now, I wanna ask you about a person that you may have heard of in your time filming at the park. Have you ever heard of a person named Lisa Clark? I have, uh, yes, that was Don Clark's ex-wife. Can you tell us what you know about Lisa? Well, um, I've only seen her in person a few times, but I knew that she and Don had a terrible relationship. She'd come to the park and Don would always ask her to leave. You said that she would come to the park. Exactly what were the, her visits to the park like? I mean, I'm sure I didn't see every time she came to the park, uh, but on times that I did see, they got into screaming matches galore. I mean, profanity, back and forth. It makes for good TV, but I never wanted to cross Lisa Clark. Do you know if Don ever had to have Lisa removed from the park? Yes, once he did. Now, you said that Don and Lisa used to have shouting matches. Do you recognize any of that behavior between Kara and Don? No, not at all. I mean, they were a married couple. Um, there are always disagreements, or so I hear, but nothing like what I saw between Lisa and Don, no. Oh, and Ms. Kwong, in your thousands of hours of filming at the park, did you ever see the investigators try and question Lisa? I didn't. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Cross? Yes, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Kwong, I'd like to start with something you just said. You said you never saw anything like shouting matches between the defendant and Mr. Clark, right? Not in the same way that I saw them with Lisa. So let's talk about the different way you saw them argue. You actually saw the defendant throw a vase at her husband. I did, one time. Uh, I, I do remember that. They were arguing uh, something with the elephant safety. And that one time she threw that vase at his head, that was just a couple months before Mr. Clark disappeared. That's correct. I believe it was in the summer of 2017. Now, as a filmmaker, you were always shooting your film at the Elephant Sanctuary, right? Uh, more or less. Uh, two years leads to thousands of hours of video. Uh, I've got my camera on me at all times. Well, everything that looked good for TV, you'd shoot it, right? Yeah, I, I could. But you just told us that you saw special agents handling evidence without gloves. I did. Uh, one of the times that I was at the park when the FBI was there. Well, just to be clear, Ms. Wong, you didn't bring any videotape of agents mishandling forensic evidence, did you? I didn't bring any video, um, but no, I didn't see it today. Let's talk about some of the things you did catch on video. Now, you interviewed the defendant a couple times, right? Uh, yes, I spoke with Miss Bassett regularly. And during one of those conversations, she talked about what she was willing to do for those animals. She spoke about it regularly. We always had conversations about the animals. Uh, really, it's quite endearing how much of a passion project it was for her. So let's talk about those endearing statements. You heard the defendant say, I will do anything to protect these elements. Um, that's right, I, I heard her say that. She was really passionate about elephant safety. She was so passionate that you heard her say, I will take someone to the grave if I have to. She did say that once. Nothing further. Any redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. Okay. This witness may be excused. Are both parties ready to proceed with closing arguments? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, just one moment. Mm -mm. 
Okay, so we're now going to proceed to closing arguments. So scoring judges, just switch over to speaker view. Um, I'm going to do that now, and I'm going to mute my audio. Uh, government, whenever you're ready to proceed. Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. The defendant kept her promise. Members of the jury, in 2017, the defendant kept the promise she made to keep her animals safe. She got them out of their cages, turned her reserve into everything she'd ever wanted. And all she had to do was get Don Clark out of the way. That's exactly what she did. The evidence shows that on August 18th of last year, the defendant killed her husband. Of course, we couldn't just tell you that's what happened. Because the prosecution, we had to prove it. And we've done that for you today. We've proven beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant killed her husband. That she did it to take control of that sanctuary. Because you've heard no other reasonable explanation for the evidence you've seen today. The defense told you that Mr. Clark disappeared in the night without a trace. That it was really Lisa Clark who was responsible for this crime. But members of the jury, that's not a reasonable story. And an unreasonable story doesn't create reasonable doubt. Mr. Madden told you he introduced evidence that there was a lawsuit between Lisa and Don Clark. That she believed he was hiding money. Members of the jury, it's not reasonable. She would kill her ex-husband so she wouldn't have access to the money she went all the way to the court to get. They're not asking you to look at reasonable doubt. They're asking you to doubt your reason. Because there's no evidence Lisa Clark had access to a potential murder weapon. No evidence Lisa Clark had access to the booths we know and were confirmed were at Big Gump Swamp the night Mr. Clark disappeared. We've met our burden. And we've done so by walking you through those three points I introduced at the beginning of this trial. Why the defendant did this, how she did it, and what evidence the defendant left behind. So first, let's start with why. You learned the answer to this question from the words of Ms. Kwong herself. She told you exactly about the explosive arguments between Don and the defendant. And sometimes she'd get passionate. And sometimes those passionate statements would lead to death threats. That she was willing to take someone to the grave to protect her animals. That she was willing to do anything. Members of the jury, what happened just a few months after the defendant made those statements? She turned that sanctuary into everything she ever wanted. She also got away with $8 million in Mr. Clark's assets. And she was guaranteed after he signed a power of attorney just a few months before he went missing. And that brings us to the next one, how? Well, Special Agent Johnson answered that for you today. Agent Johnson walked us through a timeline of events leading up to Mr. Clark's disappearance. Then you learned about the GPS tracker that revealed the defendant's path the night her husband went missing. That after that power of attorney was transferred, after Mr. Clark applied for an order of protection, it was on August 18th she made a move. She took a syringe of poison from that sanctuary. She killed her husband. Then she drove that van to Big Gum Swamp in the middle of the night. She waited a week to report him missing. The members of the jury asked yourselves, if the defendant cared for her husband so much, if she wanted her husband, the love of her life to be found, why would she wait seven days to tell anyone he was gone? You know the answer to that question. Because the defendant didn't want him to be found. And that brings us to that final question. What did the defendant leave behind? You learned there were things that the defendant just couldn't cover up in that week. Boots covered in mud from Big Gum Swamp tying her to the scene. That toxic relationship that people saw unravel. Ms. Kwong told you just months before Mr. Clark disappeared, they had an explosive argument. They argued about those elephants. 
just like Mr. Johnson said, they had an argument about how to take care of those elephants. Because Mr. Clark, he wanted a business, not a charity. The defendant couldn't cover up those statements that everyone heard. The instances of domestic violence Ms. Kwong was witness to. Members of the jury, that relationship shattered. And the arguments didn't stop there. Because even Mr. Clark was worried about what the defendant would do next. So he filed for an order of protection. And weeks later, he was gone. The defendant made a promise. When her husband got in the way, she kept it. Find the defendant guilty. Thank you. Defense. Closing from the defense. Whenever you're ready. Ms. Periano, can you bring up Exhibit 4, please? The second to last paragraph. Your Honor, members of the jury, they got the wrong wife. This is an exhibit that the investigators relied on to try and pin everything on Kara Bassett to show that their relationship was so horrendous that she would take matters into her own hands and ultimately murder her own husband. But members of the jury, the prosecution conveniently left out this entire paragraph. And so I wanna show it to you. You'll have this when you go back to deliberate and it makes the story far, far, far less reasonable and makes it very clear that the prosecution just hasn't met that burden. You see, that same attorney who wrote and talked about the relationship between Kara and Don also talked about the relationship, the relationship between Lisa and Don. She said, I assure you that all of Lisa's claims are false and meritless, but there is no convincing her. Her lawsuit was just part of the harassment. She was prone to outbursts and threats in person, by phone, by text. Mr. Clark and I considered seeking a restraining order but decided it would only make things worse, especially since they were still co-parenting. Members of the jury, that's already reasonable doubt for the prosecution's case. They had to prove to you by the highest burden that this case points to one person and one person only. This paragraph alone gives you reason to doubt that story. You have another person making the same exact threats in the same exact timelines for the same exact reasons. But Ms. Grace, she tried to explain it away. She tried to tell you that why would you murder someone and miss out on the financial incentive? Well, this paragraph explains that for you too. There wasn't actually any incentive. Her claims are false and meritless. So of course, Lisa could have taken matters into her own hands. But again, members of the jury, as the defense, we didn't have to prove that to you today. We only had to show you that it was also a likely explanation. And we've done that. Ms. Piriano, can you bring up the timeline of Ms. Lisa Clark's actions? I'm going to walk through some of the timeline of actions that Lisa Clark took during the investigation and the fact that the investigators never looked into it. First, you have in 2001, Lisa Clark marries Don Clark. They're happily married for a number of years, but they finally get divorced in January of 2011. Just one month Later, Don Clark marries Kara Bassett, and you have the letter from the attorney telling you about how the harassment starts here. Continuous harassment. How threatening him, his life in person is only a part. How Lisa used to visit the park over and over and over again, and Don Quang told you that the police had to be called and have Lisa removed because expletives are being shouted, arguments, screaming matches. Finally, Lisa has enough. She decides even though she has no merit, even though she has no basis, she's going to sue Don Clark because she needs to get what she wants. But then you get to August 18th, 2018. You get to where Don Clark goes missing. And you see that not only does Lisa Clark not have an alibi, not only does Lisa Clark not want to talk to the police? But she was also in contact with the victim of today's case on the day of his disappearance. 
She calls, she texts him at 2.37 p.m. And they speak on the phone for four minutes at 2.39 p.m. Later that day, Don Clark is never seen again. And finally, when the police try, they decide maybe this is a stone unturned and maybe we need to go ask questions. When they finally try and look at the last place that they didn't leave, uh, that they left covered, what does Lisa Clark tell them? Not only is she not gonna cooperate, but she hoped that it's true that Don is dead, that he deserved to die, that she's glad. Members of the jury, they tried to paint a timeline of how Kara Bassett hates her husband and only wanted to do whatever she could to take him to the grave. They conveniently left out other suspects, conveniently left out the timeline left by Lisa Clark. The fact that there is another very likely explanation as to what happened on that night. About how Lisa Clark calls him to meet up, drives over to that zoo, murders and drives him to that swamp using Kara Bassett's things, and then leaves. Knowing that if she just doesn't cooperate with investigators, they're never gonna look into it. They're never gonna suspect her. And instead, Ms. Bassett would have to take the fall. Again, members of the jury, what have you heard about Ms. Bassett? Nothing but the state having the wrong wife. I've heard Ms. Bassett is an avid animal lover, that she cares about her animals, about her sanctuary, that her and Don's arguments were simple arguments between a married couple. You didn't hear any indication that this woman is so evil, so filled with hatred that she would take out her husband for $8 million. $8 million that she already had access to because they lived together, they worked together, they owned the same business. The one person who truly hated Don, who truly needed him to get out of the picture just to make themselves feel better, it's none other than Lisa Clark, his first wife. Unfortunately, because the detectives never recovered a body, because they never made an autopsy, because they were never able to actually determine that Don actually was killed in the way that they suspect, that's reasonable doubt right there. Members of the jury, there is no way that this case can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt because there is no body and they never looked into Lisa Clark. The fact of the matter is, the government has the wrong wife. Pick the only reasonable choice for today's trial, to find Ms. Bassett not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Government, do you wish to make a rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, proceed. Take Mr. Madden's word for it. Lisa Clark had no incentive to commit this crime. He told us she had no motive. And without a motive, without a shred of evidence, ask yourselves, is it reasonable she was involved in this crime? And it's not because Lisa didn't have access to a murder weapon. She didn't have access to the boots we know were at Big Gum Swamp. She didn't have access to the van we know was used to transport Mr. Clark's body. Mr. Madden told you that that letter from that attorney, it proves Lisa was involved. You're gonna have that when you go back to deliberate. You're gonna see in that letter, the defendant says she wants power of attorney in the case her husband goes missing. In the case, he disappears. A clause that attorney never heard of before. She wanted that power in the case. He went missing, and weeks later, he did. The evidence points to one person and one person alone. The person who made a promise. Find her guilty. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um... So now all the scoring judges uh, take a few minutes to complete your ballots and then hit submit. And um, let, let's all just stay on even after you submit your ballot. Um, and then we'll do brief uh, emphasis on brief uh, comments to get uh, the competitors out of here. So um, take a minute or two to complete your ballot and I'll check in with everyone in a second.
Is there anyone who's not finished with your ballot? If you if you're not finished, just maybe uh, send it in the chat privately to me. Okay, I think a few people are still working. Take take another minute. So we're waiting on three more people to finish. So just uh, another minute or two should do it. 